Hey there, everybody. Good morning. It is Sunday morning, January the 22nd, 8 a.m., and we're here today in Jeremiah chapter number 34. If you're able, pardon me, able, turn your Bibles there with me, and we'll read through this this chapter together. I'm not getting off to a very good start here, am I? So we're finished with that short four chapter mini book that God had told Jeremiah to write, uh, that had all of the good news. So we're going to head into some bad news again. Uh, the first part of this chapter has some good news, but then the latter half, not as good news. And we're going to see some repetition here. We've covered some of these things already and we'll see it when it shows up. It'll be pretty clear to us. And then we've got some new insight. We do understand that God says, because of your disobedience, this captivity is going to happen. And we sometimes wonder exactly what that disobedience is. And today we'll see a little bit of it. So let's pray and cover the chapter. Father, thank you for the reading and study that we do every week. I do pray your blessing upon this one here. Give us wisdom as we learn and grow from the chapter, please. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, Jeremiah 34, the word which came unto Jeremiah from the Lord, when Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and all his army, and all the kingdoms of the earth, of his dominion, and all the people fought against Jerusalem, and against all the th cities thereof, saying. So while the onslaught is coming, this is the message given to Jeremiah. Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, go and speak to Zedekiah, king of Judah, and tell him, thus saith the Lord, behold, I will give this city into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall burn it with fire. So that's the clear and direct message that's being given to Zedekiah here. But notice, the, here's the good news. Uh, and thou, well, good news, let me read the whole thing. And thou shalt not escape out of his hand. That sounds like bad news. But shalt surely be taken and delivered into his hand. And thine eyes shall behold the eyes of the king of Babylon. And he shall speak with thee mouth to mouth, and thou shalt go to Babylon. So that should sound familiar to you. We've already read that and seen it come to pass, even in the last couple chapters. But look at here. This is the good news. Yet hear the word of the Lord, O Zedekiah, king of Judah. Thus saith the Lord of thee, thou shalt not die by the sword. Well, that's good news. He just saw, he said that you're going to see Nebuchadnezzar face to face, and you're going to speak to him mouth to mouth. So he's going to be in the presence of Nebuchadnezzar. It would be very easy for the king of the conquering nation to tell his servant, kill him. But that's not going to happen. You're not going to die by the sword, Zedekiah. But thou shalt die in peace. That's good news, isn't it? And with the burnings of thy fathers, the former kings which were before thee, so shall they burn odors for thee, and they will lament thee, saying, Ah, Lord, for I have pronounced the word, saith the Lord. Then Jeremiah the prophet spake all these words unto Zedekiah, king of Judah, in Jerusalem, when the king of Babylon's army fought against Jerusalem and against all the cities of Judah that were left, against Lachish and against Azekah, for these defense cities remain to the cities of Judah. So Jeremiah delivers this message to Zedekiah, and I'll tell you, it's not news that he wants to hear that he's going to be invaded and ultimately destroyed. We understand that. But then to hear that he's going to survive, that he's not going to be put to death, that he's going to face Nebuchadnezzar, but Nebuchadnezzar's going to spare him. He's going to live a peaceful life in Babylon until the time of his death. And when he dies, he'll die peacefully. And not only that, but his people will burn incense and odors to remember fondly the life of Zedekiah. So while this is a terrible thing to have happen, uh, it's not simply his fault that all of it's occurring. It is his fault to a degree because he didn't turn things around, but it's just the culmination of many, many generations, hundreds of years of wicked kings, and God's had enough of it. The good news for Zedekiah is you'll live out your days in peace. Now, we're going to see from verse 8 through the rest of the chapter, and we'll probably read large sections of this <coughs> without stopping, that one of the reasons that God took them. Verse 8, this is the word that came unto Jeremiah from the Lord, 
After that, the king Zedekiah had made a covenant with all the people which were at Jerusalem to proclaim liberty unto them, that every man should let his manservant and every man his maidservant, being in Hebrew or in Hebrewists, go free, that none should serve himself of them, to wit, of a Jew his brother. Now when all the princes and all the people which had entered into the covenant heard that every one should let his manservant and every one his maidservant go free, that none should serve themselves of them any more, then they obeyed and let them go. But afterward they turned and caused the servants and the handmaids whom they had let go free to return and brought them into subjection for servants and for handmaids. So the Lord had told his people, and he's about to reiterate it in the next few verses, uh, in the law of Moses, that someone is supposed to serve you six years, and then you let them go in their seventh year. And there were some stipulations. If they chose to stay, they could do that under certain principles and guidelines. But we're just speaking of the servitude in general here. So six years of servitude, and they go free in their seventh year. And they weren't doing that. And then here, God tells them, hey, let the people go. But then they would go back and capture them again and put them back into servitude, presumably starting that calendar all over again. So what you have here is you have oppression of people and you have greed at play. And so that's what's happening. And God is displeased with that. Verse 12. Therefore the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, I made a covenant with your fathers in the day that I brought them forth out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondmen, saying, In fact, think about it, <clears throat> I delivered you from bondage. And now you've taken and put your own people in bondage. I brought you from a foreign land where you were all bondmen, and I gave you freedom. And now you're enslaving each other. Verse 14, at the end of seven years, let ye go every man, his brother in Hebrew, which hath been sold unto thee. And when he hath served thee six years, thou shalt let him go free from thee. But your fathers hearken not unto me, neither inclined their ear. And ye were now turned and had done right in my sight in proclaiming liberty every man to his neighbor. And ye had made a covenant before me in the house which is called by my name. But ye turned and polluted my name, and caused every man his servant and every man his handmaid, whom ye had set at liberty at their pleasure, to return and brought them into subjection, to be unto you for servants and for handmaids. So he said, you know, uh, your forefathers brought the people out of Egypt, and then they uh, were instructed that if someone served, you let them go after six years, but they didn't do that. And then I commanded you all to do the same thing, and you did it at first, but then you went back to it. And so that's no different than never having done it in the first place. So, verse number 17, Therefore, thus saith the Lord, ye have not hearkened unto me, in proclaiming liberty, every one to his brother, and every man to his neighbor. Behold, I proclaim a liberty for you, saith the Lord, to the sword, to the pestilence, and to the famine. And I will make you to be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth. And I will give the men that have transgressed my covenant, which have not performed the words of my covenant, which they had made before me when they cut the calf in twain and passed between the parts thereof. One of the uh, ceremonial aspects of a covenant was an animal would be cut in two. Think of Jacob. I think he was the first. No, Abraham was the first one to do this. Animal parts cut in two, separated, and as they burned, the parties would walk between the pieces. And so God, he's a little uh, sarcastic here back in verse number uh, 16, is it? Uh, yeah, he says, you turn and polluted my name uh, and brought them into subjection. Verse 17, uh, ye have not hearkened unto me. Behold, I proclaim a liberty for you to the sword, to pestilence and to famine. That's some pretty dark sarcasm there. You know, you wouldn't set other people free. So I'll tell you what, I'm going to set you free. You're not going to have to worry about being uh, in the famine. You're not going to have to worry about pestilence. You're not going to have to worry about being attacked because I'm going to have you taken captive by neighboring nations. And that's what he does. 
Verse, uh, let's see here, 19. The princes of Judah and the princes of Jerusalem, the eunuchs and the priests and all the people of the land which pass between the parts of the calf, I will even give them into the hand of their enemies, into the hand of them that seek their life, and their dead bodies shall be for meat unto the fowls of heaven and to the beasts of the earth. And Zedekiah, king of Judah, and his princes will I give into the hand of their enemies, and into the hand of them that seek their life, and into the hand of the king of Babylon's army, which are gone up from you. Behold, I will command, saith the Lord, and cause them to return to this city, and they shall fight against it, and take it, and burn it with fire. And I will make the cities of Judah a desolation without an inhabitant. And of course, a lot of that is repetition for us. We know what's coming. We understand how it's going to happen. Remember again, this is not a chronological book at all. It's a compilation of all of the teachings, preachings, and writings of Jeremiah. But here, two things to take away. One, God's going to not allow Zedekiah to be taken and murdered by Nebuchadnezzar. He's going to survive and live his days out and die in peace and honor. Will he find it as a memorial? And then secondarily, one of the reasons God's doing this is because the people of Israel were just unjust. They didn't treat each other right. Uh, they didn't allow that freedom that they were supposed to when one uh, has satisfied their six years of servitude. And even our society here in the United States, we have a, uh, a debt system where once seven years has passed, bad debts will fall off of a credit report and they're forgiven and put behind that individual. And so God's a God of mercy and he's a God that doesn't want people taking advantage of one another or so crushing someone that they have to be perpetually uh, indebted on this hamster wheel type of a system. All right, pretty simple chapter here today. Thanks so much for watching. As always, please like, love, and share the post. Let people know that we're out here, and we'll be back tomorrow live with chapter number 35. Live with 35. How corny am I? God bless you. Have a wonderful Lord's Day.